Hey guys, Brian Beeler coming to you from the Storage View Lab. We've been working on an amazing project the last several months, and while it only took us two to complete, we've managed to compute Pi to 100 trillion digits. And while that isn't really a record in its own, Google Cloud did that last year. What we did was take that number of days that they used to get that computation done, and we absolutely smoked it. And how do we do that? We use this server over my shoulder here. It's a twin AMD Epic fourth gen uh, server. It's a Quanta platform, two U as you can see, two CPUs inside. And then we managed to squish in 19 of these Solidime 30.72 terabyte QLC SSDs. Now you might be saying there's 24 bays on here and we'll dig into the hardware later because we did have to get creative as Kevin often does when it comes to getting enough storage into one system for this computation. But even so, this system holds half a petabyte of storage, which was critical in fitting all those little tiny Pi digits into the SSDs inside. After that storage filled up and the Pi computation was complete, we had another problem entirely. We had to get a 100 terabyte, one 100 terabyte text file off of this system down into the hard drive system below, which has a whole separate set of compromises. So we're gonna walk through all of that, sort of the madness that ensued to get there, and to help lead us through some of the reasons why we did this computation, how it all worked, and why we had to do the things we did from a hardware perspective, we're gonna bring in Jordan who'll walk you through all of that. Over here, we're remoted into our AMD Epic Genoa system with 192 cores of CPU, a terabyte and a half of RAM, our 19 Solidime QLC SSDs, and our mapped 200 terabyte output volume on our remote server. All of this in order to use a program called Y-Cruncher to kick it off and let it run for 60 days to produce us a single output file with 100 trillion digits of pi in it. Our initial testing with this, we had planned on this taking somewhere between 30 and 45 days based on running smaller increments of pi 1 trillion over and over and going through our optimizations. It turns out that as you scale, there are some other overhead factors that we run into, be it with the program or the way the swaps are occurring, that it ended up stretching that timeline out by a little bit. Google Cloud used their cloud compute platform and a number of distributed storage nodes in order to compute their 100 trillion digits. We did ours with all locally attached NVMe storage, courtesy of Solidime. That gave us a significant speed advantage because while Google's main compute node had 100 gigabits a second worth of egress, we far exceeded that by using 19 direct attached NVMe disks. So we selected Y-Cruncher for the computation of 100 trillion digits of pi for a number of reasons. First and foremost, it's widely used and respected in the overclocking and benchmarking community as a golden standard to help test system performance be it all CPU and memory, which most tests are bound to, or the system as a whole, when you start adding in swap space for the program to be able to do larger calculations that don't fit purely in system memory. White Cruncher is a partially open source program. However, because some of the key pieces of the code are still closed source and tightly controlled by the developer, that provides a very robust and repeatable uh, validation technique that anybody can use our validation file and verify that all of the times and the numbers are correct in there without having to worry that it has been tampered with thanks to the encryption provided by the closed side of the program. So here we are remoted into our server in the rack, our Genoa server. We've got our 96 core processor, two sockets, 192 threads, terabyte and a half of DDR5 running at 4800 megahertz. And you can see we don't have all 19 drives mapped independently anymore. We'll get to why that is, but they are all in here, all of the Solidime 30 terabyte drives. Uh, they do come out to be a little bit smaller on the capacity once they're formatted. So here's Y Cruncher. This is how it looks when it's done. At the very beginning, you configure what you want to do. We're calculating the constant pi using the Chinovsky formula from 1988. We're going to calculate 100 trillion decimal digits in hexadecimal, which is part of what's calculated first, is actually the hexadecimal digits, and then it's converted to decimal. That was 83 trillion hexadecimal di digits. Now, the computation mode that we had to use is what's called swap mode, because 100 trillion digits, that's 100 terabytes, cannot fit into RAM. 
Swap mode enables us to provide each drive directly to Y Cruncher and give it direct I.O. access in order to issue SCSI commands to the disk to be most efficient. And then Y Cruncher internally actually handles the RAID 0 of the drives and writes and reads them as balanced as it can. Depending on how many you give to it, the more efficient it can be. So here you can see our configuration of using 19 drives in a RAID 0. Again, the RAID 0 is a software-defined RAID within Y Cruncher, and we'll get to why we use only 19 drives later in the video. We chose a 36 megabyte Seek, and unfortunately, parallelism is not enabled in the application anymore. We still did use a good chunk of system memory. We used 1.38 terabytes of system memory. So we had a start time. We started this back on February 9th at about 5.40 in the afternoon, Cincinnati time. Uh, we did actually make a brief stop for uh, just some tuning. So that did add about a two hours to our time. But when we're talking about 60 days or so, it wasn't that big of a deal. And the benefits that we gained from doing some of the CPU tuning, which is why you only see pure cores exposed and not threads, those benefits far outweighed the hour or two that we had in downtime. Y Cruncher uses the SSDs to swap data back and forth between RAM, and that's part of the biggest bottleneck of doing a calculation like this, is getting your swap space as fast as possible for your CPU to access, which we actually see pretty well all over the market right now, as disk speed is seeming to be the biggest bottleneck in a lot of application performance. Y Cruncher during this time period put several petabytes through each of these drives and really gave them a good workout. As you can see, it took 47.828 days to calculate pi, and that was just the hexadecimal digits. It then took us another 20 hours almost to write all of those hexadecimal digits out across to our iSCSI target. From there, we had to do a base conversion on those digits, which took an additional 2.8 days, and then it took another 20, almost 25 hours to write the decimal digits out. Again, we're talking about a 100 terabyte file because each digit is a byte. If we look at our decimal file, we have 100 trillion and two. Why the two? Well, because the three and the dot in the very beginning of pi take up the first two bytes, and then you get our 100 trillion. For those interested, down here at the very bottom, the program does do a spot check based on the previous calculation done by Google, and it's able to validate and say, yes, we did a correct calculation of 100 trillion digits all the way up to 100 trillion. Since that's currently the largest known number of pi, that's all that we can spot check to. For those extra curious, the 100 trillion digit of pi was a zero. So being that 100 trillion is the largest known number and the largest that we could spot check to, in order to go higher, we would actually have to perform the calculation twice using two methods, which does occur when you do this process. So when we do go higher, we'll be able to provide our own validation on those results. Now, 186 terabytes is a lot of file to store. Notepad is not gonna just open a 100 terabyte text file, much less than 86, I'm sorry, much less than 83 terabyte hexadecimal text file. We had to have a place to be able to store this, and because all of our disks inside the server, even though it was a half a petabyte, it was all being used for the swap. So we had to have a place to put it. So we used a wonderful Supermicro server mapped over four iSCSI paths in a RAID 0. Because we needed 183 terabytes and iSCSI targets only have a 50 terabyte limitation, we were forced to use four in order to give us the 200 terabytes worth of space that we presumed we would need in order to write out all the digits. All right, so everyone's been talking about the 16 drives on the front. To make a little more sense of that, when you start uh, looking in the inside of the server, you see all these NVMe connections going to the front backplane. The uh, final eight bays don't have the NVMe enablement kit connected. They just have these uh, satellites. That means that while the backplane is NVMe capable, it's not enabled yet. And at the time when we started this review, Quanta did not have the uh, enablement kit available uh, for our testing. It's something that's probably going to be coming out uh, soon. It just was not available at the time we kicked off the uh, Pi project. 
Now to move around that, we got these adapters. We have uh, three PCA slots available inside the system. And while it looks like there's some space on the sides, there's not actually uh, slots available to, uh, to plug stuff into. And it just so happened that we we're able to leverage uh, some OCP slots on the bottom for our uh, tank of networking. And then uh, we had these uh, really cheap uh, PCIe uh, sleds to attach the three remaining uh, 30 terabyte solid on SSDs. So inside the system, we have uh, two 9654 uh, AMD Epic Gen 4 CPUs, CPU one and two. And then we have 1.5 terabytes of RAM. Now it's a fairly stout build. Most platforms probably won't have that much uh, stuffed inside of them, but it gives you an idea of the potential of the compute, uh, the compute power you can stick inside a 2U box with the uh, AMD Epic uh, Gen 4. Now when this thing's on, there's uh, obviously a cowl that uh, helps you, helps the system cool itself across these massive heat sinks. For the sake of uh, this, uh, this overview, we took a lot of those components off. It is still on. We don't want to turn it off until we've captured everything on our video side for uh, this Pi project. So it's a little bit precarious, but sitting idle, it's uh, fairly cool to the touch still. There's not a lot of risk there. So while I have pedal by a flash does sound like a lot, that's only part of the uh, calculation phase. We still have to store the ultimate output file. And that is where our um, file server comes into play. And this gives us uh, right, a little bit over 200 terabytes of storage across a number of uh, hard drives. And uh, it's set up in a fairly unique configuration. Uh, this provides a, uh, I think we have 200, uh, maybe 250 terabytes of uh, storage in a uh, RAID 10 pool. And then we use uh, two 10 gig links up uh, into the uh, Genoa server um, on their own direct attach network. We're bypassing a switch on this and that was so this environment could live, uh, live off on its own in case there were power outages or other problems. And uh, from there, we provision four 50 terabyte LUNs over RAID 0 to the Genoa box. Now that might seem a little bit crazy, but we're, this entire project re required some insanity aspects to it. But it works, and it's the important thing. So in most of our reviews, the uh, situation with power isn't as big of an item that uh, you might think. If, a, uh, if power goes out during a test, if it goes longer than maybe 15 minutes, we'll just kick off a new test. It's not a big deal. For this project though with uh, Pi, we were in the range of months and we didn't, uh, we didn't wanna have to worry about restarting the test, possibly corrupting our progress midway. And we've been, uh, so to handle that, uh, we've been doing a lot of these uh, portal power station reviews. Uh, EcoFlow has been a fantastic partner of ours, and as things worked out, we ended up having three of these uh, Delta Pros sitting around, giving us 10.8 uh, uh, kilowatt hours of uh, total battery capacity. And we had one for our file server, two for our um, AMD General box, which if power were to drop out from a bad storm or so on, we would have between five and eight hours of uh, runtime between peak CPU load and maybe more idle load, uh, but it allowed us to write out any poor circumstance without going on to like a full uh, standby generator. Now, uh, some of you guys that uh, follow the power space might realize that portal power stations don't really have the hold uh, holdover time required to uh, work with a lot of uh, sensitive IT equipment. And that, uh, that means that uh, in a power failure situation to go from AC to battery power needs around 30 milliseconds, which if you just had this powering a uh, server or desktop, it would kill the power uh, right when it uh, switched over and the thing would turn off. So to mitigate that, we have a uh, Eaton 9PX uh, UPS, also 120 uh, 20 volt based, uh, which helps us keep that uh, switch over time within limits of what the servers can handle. So in any situation where the building would lose power, uh, the portal power stations would kick from DC to AC. That would trip over for maybe a second or two. And then the systems would keep on chunking along no matter what happens. All right, so I'm so proud of our team and what we've accomplished with this Pi computation. And this is just the start. Getting to 100 trillion faster than Google, a lot faster than Google, was exciting for us in our own selfish sort of way, right? It's great to see all the action. It's great to use all the toys that we had available to us at the time. 
We didn't go out and have to do much fancy. Although if you were doing this professionally, you might do it with a little more data resiliency. Uh, something like a nice big all flash array would have been handy. Uh, uh, a storage array for the output that had uh, data protection might, might have been smart. But we did what we did with what we had on hand and, and uh, couldn't be more proud of our team, Jordan and Kevin specifically, who did a lot of this work. I did most of the overseeing, uh, but that's an important job too. Now, one of the really fun things though, is after this is done, what do you do with that 100 terabyte file if you want to protect it? We could back it up with some of the appliances we have on site if we made a little room for it. We do run other things than just Pi in this lab, but that's not exactly great data hygiene. The 321 rule suggests that you've got to have a backup copy and it's got to get off site. And for that, we're working with our friends at Amazon. The AWS Snowballs, this is where it's at. These 80 terabyte monsters are going to get our 100 terabyte file to the cloud and get there in style. To learn more about that project, stay tuned for our next video.